You're listening to Crushing Classical, how to thrive in your creative career. I'm your host, Janet Ingle, oboist, entrepreneur, author, and business and creative coach for musicians. On today's episode, you'll hear my interview with James Hearn, who recently sold his house and left his job and moved across the country to go all in on his music career as an adult. This interview is full of gems for the working musician. I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanksgiving, everybody. If you celebrate, if you're in the U.S., you're listening today, I welcome you. I struggle with this holiday sometimes. It's roots in colonialism, of course, and the complications of families. But at heart, it's one of my favorite celebrations. I can really get behind a day that is all about gratitude and company and food. These are some of my favorite things. So let me say out loud that I'm grateful for you, listener, and for your patience with me as I find my podcasting voice and work on my mission of spotlighting and celebrating musicians who are creating their own paths in the field. And because this is a family day, I thought I would take this opportunity to showcase my own brother and his inspiring career pivot and the ways he thinks about his own business of musicianship. James Hearn writes smart, poetic lyrics and singable melodies, and he's recently transitioned to a brand new city, Austin, Texas, to go full-time as a jobbing musician. He sent a newsletter at the end of September this year, and I thought his statistics were really something to celebrate, so I wanted to go ahead and read this document into the record before we even start. So here's me quoting James now. Can you believe it? This Friday marks one year spent in Texas, one year spent as a full-time musician, and one year where I haven't yet starved to death. Some stats. In the first 365 days, I played 151 shows at 65 different venues, bars, breweries, farmer's markets, old folks' homes, and more, almost 400 hours of stage time, driven 13,600 plus miles for work, not counting the 1850 miles it took to get to Texas, and sweated through and or broken nearly 120 sets of guitar strings. I had $1,000 worth of gear stolen out of my car and replaced it all. Dolly, my bulldog, and I have moved through four different apartments in two different cities and even found ourselves a regular trivia team on Monday nights. This summer was the hottest in 15 years, and I never broke down and wore shorts on stage, passed out. I've eaten an awful lot of queso and drank more than my share of Lone Star. I've joined and gigged with a band, Hop It ATX, a multi-genre party and wedding band, as a lead guitarist and vocalist, and founded another one, Kathleen Turner Overdrive, Songs in the Key of Cusack, which will make its stage debut this weekend. Starting next month, I'm beginning a six-month weekly residency at the venerable Cheatham Street Warehouse, an infamous singer-songwriter stronghold in San Marcos. This is a huge honor for a writer, to say nothing of a Yankee. More importantly, I finally feel like I'm doing what I'm here to do. I come home from playing six hours of gigs, fingers aching, and grab a guitar to noodle on while I watch TV anyway. I've increased my songbook for solo shows to over 700 songs and have a constant running list of 20 or 30 more to learn as I go. While I haven't been writing anywhere near as much as I would like, what I have written feels like it's as good or better than my past work. I struggle with anxiety and depression and poor time management as much as ever, but I wake up every day feeling more purposeful and in my element than I maybe ever have. I was well into my 30s before I had a day job that paid as much as I grossed my first year here. Now, that probably says a lot more about the kind of jobs I had than it does about my work here, but while I wouldn't say I'm stable or comfortable or, you know, prepared for emergencies, I'm doing much, much better than I ever expected my first year as a musician could be. Here's me, Janet, again. I want to point out to you that James is not in a classical music niche, nor is he necessarily doing innovative entrepreneurial work that pushes the boundaries of what creatives can be in the world. 
But I share this conversation with you because I feel like there's value in hearing about the hustle and about the business side of creating the artistic life you want to lead. You know from my book that I'm not interested in pushing musicians to make their living exclusively through their art. Not necessarily, but I am strongly on the side of creative people choosing the way they want to live and finding ways to make that happen for themselves. And that's why I find James's story so inspiring. And I hope you will too. Happy Thanksgiving and thanks for listening. Remember when I interviewed Heidi K. Begay back in episode 12? She is all about helping musicians to thrive and grow, and she's one of the creators of the Ultimate Music Business Summit, which will take place in January of 2023. This event will feature more than two dozen expert presentations and live panels over three days. I'll be one of the presenters, but I'm even more excited to attend myself and to learn from the experts in various aspects of our music business. Early bird tickets are on sale this month, and I have a special link in the show notes to get you connected to this summit. If you're building your own creative business or thinking about it, you might want to look into the Ultimate Music Business Summit. James Hearn, welcome to Crushing Classical. Hi, I'm glad to be here. I am so excited to talk with you right now, James, because I feel like I talk with musicians all the time who are sort of in their day job and a little overwhelmed by their day job and busy and working a little on the side and wanting to be full-time musicians and not quite finding their way to doing it. And here is what I understand, James. A year ago, you stopped doing your day job and you went to an entirely new community to become a full-time performing musician and you're killing it. This is my understanding. That's uh, that's reasonably accurate. I mean, you know, killing it has, it's a, uh, there's a spectrum of what you would consider killing it, but um, you know, I have not yet taken on a regular job since I got here uh, and I'm hoping to not have to, although obviously we'll see how the winter goes, but. Uh, yeah, I spent a very, very long time doing day jobs I didn't care about and a night job that I did. And mm -hmm. uh, then it seemed like it might be time to try and do the night job and just do that for a while and see where it went. That's amazing. It takes a real like leap of faith and a leap of courage. And even though you are not in the classical music world, um, you're a singer songwriter and a fantastic one. I feel like there's going to be a lot of of magic for people in hearing about what it what it took to mm -hmm. do what you to do what you did and now to do what you are now doing. So if you would, could you just sort of walk us back a little bit? Have you always been? Um, have you always been a singer songwriter? <laughs> are you now or have you ever been? Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was raised uh, by the same weirdos that you were. Um, Indeed. So we had a, a great deal of music in the household, uh, played piano as a child, didn't like it very much, um, played French horn when I was in, in school, and that was you know fine. Uh, when I was 13, 14, uh, there was a guitar lying around our house. I don't know where it came from or, or why, um, but I got this idea in my head that I could uh, get girls if I learned to play guitar and sing. Um, which has not actually worked in all these years, but uh, it turned out that I really liked playing. Um, so then I wrote my first uh, quite bad song when I was 15 or 16. Um, started my first uh, not all that good band when I was 16 or 17. Um, and have been writing and playing pretty much ever since. Fantastic. And as you grew up, as you became a grown up, you know, you were, of course, of course, you were working jobs, you were taking care of yourself. But somehow, I, I always see you performing, I always see you putting out albums, I always see you doing these things. And it takes a lot of work and effort, I think, to um, really maintain and develop an artistic life along the side of a 40 hour a week, actual mm -hmm. job. Like yeah. how how were you able to keep that going? And what was that like? Um, I just didn't sleep a lot, uh, which was sort of the case ever since I was a kid anyway. So that's not a huge change of things. Um, you know, I sort of just never took a job that I 
thought would interfere on some level. There was a job that had flexibility. It was a job that had, which of course meant that it was a job that didn't pay very well. Um, but the sort of thing that you can duck out of to go do a gig here or a gig there. Um, you know, my sort of mid twenties, I didn't really work as much musically as I would have liked to. It did a lot of kind of home mucking about, but uh, in my sort of mid to later twenties, I've got a pretty good band going for started doing some touring in the Northeast and, you know, it just became more and more of a thing where this is, you know, every time I would do it, I cared about it. And I would then get up the next morning and go to my day job that I didn't really care about and say, well, that was dumb. Why am I doing this when I could be doing that? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it just was uh, at the expense of, you know, a social life or a savings account or uh, any of the, the, typical markers of being a 20 or 30 something person, you know, uh, children and house buying and whatever else. I just didn't ever really care about any of that. Um, So instead I would go home and write songs and play shows to four people and, and I still do it. So here we are. It's it's amazing. Like what, um, can we talk a little bit? Like, I know what it looks like if I'm, sitting around and wishing I had a gig, I sort of know what I might do, right? I would probably reach out, look for the little orchestras that are in the area. I might reach out to the oboists there, to the personnel managers there. If I needed some chamber music in my life, I might reach out to uh, the clarinets and bassoons and flutes and, Mm -hmm. and French horn players who lived in my area and say, hey, who wants to put together a quintet? But it feels like a, a difficult step for it feels like a difficult step to go from, I am in my house in my twenties, practicing music. I'm writing songs. I love what I'm doing. Wouldn't it be great if I had an audience in a stage? What does that, what does that look like for doing what you do? So uh, it's a lot of email, uh, which has been uh, wonderful for uh, not having to make phone calls, send hard copy things through the mail all the time. When I was starting out, it was very much like, send us your press kit, which is like a CD of stuff and uh, photos and everything else. Um, you know, and that's a, a kind of a pain to have to deal with with hard copy. So everything going to digital has been spectacularly easy, but it's a lot of uh, looking for places that do what you want to do. And then a lot of being very, very patient about reaching out to them and understanding that it may take, uh, as I'm working on here in in Austin, uh, Mm -hmm. there are places I have emailed once a month since three months before I moved here. And that only answered me last month for the first time. Um, And there are places I've emailed every month since I moved to Austin that have not yet answered me and they maybe never will. Um, and it may be, they don't want what I do and it may be that they just are too busy. You know, there's no hard feelings, emails, exhausting. Um, but so it's a lot of just researching to try to find, okay, well I play music in this kind of realm. So this punk rock bar probably is not going to want to deal with me. And this jazz bar is definitely not going to want to deal with me, but this, rock and roll bar might this winery that does folk singers might you know um so it's just it's just a ton of uh, at this point googling uh as well mm-hmm. as you find other people doing what you're doing you see where they're playing you try to reach out to those places as well um so anytime i see someone playing solo folk music uh in austin i kind of check out the website say hey where where are you at where, where do you play Oh, I haven't heard of that place. I wonder if I can play there. And you start to stretch out that way. And it almost sounds like a it almost sounds like another full-time job, just sort of keeping track of all of the places that you want to reach to and uh following the the little rabbit holes of ooh, this person, what's this person doing? Well, how are you do do you have a, a system, like a spreadsheet? Are you keeping track of the places that you reach out to, or is this all sort of skin of your tea thing and like i'm not putting you on the spot i'm i'm genuinely curious because i know it's it's a it's a little of both i do have a, a spreadsheet with um let's see currently about 200 entries uh in austin for i have it like it is the page for for booze places because the 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 booze circuit for rock musicians and folk musicians is is absolutely essential wineries mm-hmm. breweries distilleries uh brew pubs 
typically just want music all the time. Uh, and so I have, you know, there's the booze page, which has 150, 200 names on it for all the wineries and breweries and, and, you know, bars to a point, but it's all, it's a lot of more uh, alcohol creation. Um, yes. And then I have one for farmer's markets because they usually will have someone come in and sing for a couple hours in the daytime, which is nice because most of your bar gigs are night times or at least afternoons. Um, I've got one for old folks homes, which is a new thing that I picked up kind of relatively recently was to realize that I really like seeing old country songs. You know who likes old country songs is old Texan old people. Old country people. Yeah. Um, so I do a couple of those, uh, sometimes many as three a week, sometimes none a week, just depends on the scheduling. Um, then I got a whole spreadsheet for those. Uh, the trick comes in that maybe half, ish of the places i'm talking to uh have like an email address they want to work with the other half for their initial communication have a uh contact a throw website kind of thing as a website form um and the downside of that is i don't have a great system to know when i have reached out to somebody that way and what i said to them at that point um so there's definitely been mm-hmm. times that I think I've probably over spammed someone because I forgot that I hit them a week earlier. I try to keep a rotation every three ish weeks. So I'm not killing anybody with my emails, but getting it off enough, they're going to keep seeing the name pop up and keep seeing that I'm interested. And that has worked. You know, there's places that, again, I emailed every three weeks for 12 months and I'm suddenly like, hey, you know, we've got an opening next Tuesday cool. I'm there. I'm on it. It's mine. Let's do it. That's, this is great information actually. And I'm just going to spotlight for our classical musicians in the audience um, that places where booze is served or created can also have little woodwind trios, little string quartets, like depending on the vibe that they're going for, they do want music, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Old folks homes are fantastic. They, they're dying for music. And what you're describing is just having researched as many places as you can possibly find and reaching out to them. Do you, do you worry about reaching out to them too often? Um, a little bit. If only that it would bother me if someone emailed me every week uh, asking me the same thing. Um, you know, and I do, and there's, there's a few who have it eventually been like, listen, we've got your name on our list. Like, we'll call you if we have anything. And I'm like, okay, cool. Mark that one. Don't bother them for a few months. Let them kind of do their thing. You know, the other trick too is that people change jobs. So you may have a relationship with someone who does the booking for a venue for six months and then they move on. They might not tell you because what need is it of yours to have that information um but so you're sending emails to a person that no longer is there and maybe someone new is getting those emails forwarded and maybe they're not uh so there's there's always the kind of how often yeah it's it's absolutely a concern to kind of find that balancing point of where it's Mm -hmm. regular enough that it shows you know interest and motivation but not so regular that you're like god this guy again Yeah. I feel like I've talked with a couple of people who are podcast hosts, like I am, Mm -hmm. um, about the people who reach out to pitch themselves for podcasts. And it is absolutely true that I get people who have have reached out three, four times, and I didn't answer the first couple of times because it didn't look like a good fit. And then they they get persistent enough. I'm like, okay, let me check. Let me actually click on this link. Or they just word it in a slightly different way the next time. So it's not exactly like they're just pasting their their standard form podcast pitch into the thing. Yeah. Like they say something that makes me think, oh, this person is a human on the other side of this email and is actually interested. Right. Which, yeah, I, which I is try difficult, to, right? Yeah, yeah. But every every month or so, every round roughly, I will typically rewrite the email pitch. Um, it is a copy-paste pitch to a certain degree, but it will be updated to, hey, you know, once I got to my one year, I said, hey, I've been here for a year. I played 150 shows. Um, I played 20 something last month. So now I can say I've played 135 shows. Um, mm-hmm. And then if it's someplace that I played once eight months ago, I'll like add in a, hey, I had a great time last time I played there. Like if I don't have a relationship with them, but I have played there, I'll mention, yes, you did see me once. Let's do it again. Um, 
and then there are ones where I talk to them all the time uh, and I will just, hey, yeah, what you got for me? Like there are some that are this quick. It's yeah. like, what you got? You up? You know? <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the places I play a lot is a brewery in North Austin called Celis that I play uh, all the time. And um, I've been back and forth that manager, Trevor, since last October, November, when I first met him. And, uh, you know, he's usually, he's busy. He's a GM of a pretty big brewery. He's got things to do besides deal with my worthlessness, you know. So there'll be times I'll send an email and not hear anything back for a week, two weeks. Um, there was a round earlier this year when, like, I had probably sent two or three emails and not got anything back. And I'm kind of like, well, I wonder if he left. Like, I wonder if Trevor changed jobs. So I'm like, well, let me go back to their like info at, you know, uh, because maybe Trevor at is getting me nowhere. Um, and so I go to info at, and I set my, my pitch, you know, I've been here a bunch of times. I love it, blah, blah. And like an hour later, he responds back. We've known each other for a long time. What's, what's up? Like, what's this email about? I'm like, well, I didn't know, man. I thought you might have gone somewhere. Um, but yeah. He's just busy. And that's, that happens. Mm-hmm. So sure. Sure. Like inbox maintenance is a challenge for everybody. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot, it, there's a ton of thick skinness to it to say like, I don't take it personally if they don't answer. I don't take it personally if they don't want a solo act. I don't take it personally if I played there and they never call back a second time. Like who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. All you can do is be polite and be persistent. And I, I offer a thing that you potentially want. And I'm going to keep offering it until you're like, you know what? We don't do this. Stop bothering me. Fine. Off the list. Right now, that thing you said is so valuable to people who are pitching themselves for music gigs, but also people who are in business, who are trying to like make offers and put them out there. I'm thinking of my coaches. I'm thinking of my teachers. Um, Be thick skinned and don't take a no as like a personal affront. Mm -hmm. It's not personal. It's just they're looking at what they need. And maybe you don't fit it right now, but the, the act of putting yourself in front of them, the act of saying, Hey, I looked at your venue. It looks fantastic. I know this other act that was there. I think you'd really like me. We should try this. Like it's a brave act and it's, and obviously it's working out for you on the whole really, really well. Yeah. So far so good. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, and I've got I've got some that I play every month, and I've got some that I play multiple times a month, and I've got some that I play every fourth month, and then there's always fifty new places that I'm just looking to see, hey, what you got going? And you know, I haven't even put in anywhere near the shoe leather that I could and should put in to like go to Sixth Street on a Friday night and just walk up and down and see mm. where there's music and what kind of music. Um, I've done some of that but not as much as, as I could do. Um, and so like, I, it's one of those, whenever the work is a little bit slower, I kind of think, okay, what can I do to, what more can I do? What am I, now that I have some time because I'm not playing eight gigs this week, <laughs> what do I have time to do? Should I go to these, you know, 10 breweries and ask them who books and get a more specific email address? Should I go to this neighborhood and just kind of walk around and see what's going on? Like walking in Austin is not a particularly not a real walkable city, which is part of the bummer is kind of everything is mm-hmm. drive to a neighborhood, drive from bar to bar because there's nothing too close. But um, it's, yeah, there's always more options available. There's always more things I can be trying to do. Um, there's a few companies that do booking kind of things, one of which I just finally connected with today uh, after trying for months and months. I finally am on a list where they're throwing out dates Nice. Pretty, pretty wildly. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I've already added four to the next two months just today from that. So, yeah. So I'll just like uh, highlight the thing you just said, which is when the work is slow, you think about what can I do to improve the situation? What can I do right now to like help my actual career? And this goes a little bit to the dilemma of the portfolio career musician or the dilemma of anybody, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're so focused and you're working so hard and there literally is always something else you could be doing and you ha- have to balance that with being able to like take care of your actual physical self too sometimes surely you would rather just stay home and veg in front of the television set for god's sake 
then like put yourself out there one more night that you don't happen to be yeah. standing up and singing for people. Yeah. And I, I, I certainly will, will, uh, confess in no small terms that I'm a lazy, lazy man. It's no, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the joy of the work that I do is that it, it, even the bad gigs don't feel like work. Um, getting the bad gigs is work. Yeah. Finding the bad gigs is work. And that's sort of what I have to keep reminding myself is that I'm getting paid for all of it, not just for the parts that are. Um, but then there's also the thought of, okay, well, can I instead, should I take a few hours every day this week to work up some new material just to keep the, the catalog changing? Should I, mm -hmm. uh, God forbid, make time to write songs, which I have not been very good about doing in the last few months. Um, so there's that, there's that balance too of saying, well, you know, yes, the actual booking is super important because that's where the money comes from, but also sure. I need to be able to provide the material they want. I need to have the mm -hmm. show they want. Um, and so there's a balance of like, how much can I make that my show of the songs that I want to play? And how much can I make that about what an audience wants to hear? Um, I have a bit of a weird taste in the world. So it's, uh, it's a challenge to say, okay, how far can I push in this, you know, uh, Texas singer songwriter of the seventies direction and how much I have to come back and play some nineties pop songs just to keep them engaged. How much yeah. can I put in my own stuff? How much can I not? Uh, there's a lot of, process is happening there well that's it's fantastic actually that's the direction i was just about to go and to to ask how much you how much of what you do is reacting live to the audience that is actually in front of you and like bringing what you feel like they need and and how much are you able to like you started to talk about it and I kind of just right. want you to keep talking about it instead of sure, me trying sure. to come up with an intelligent question. <laughs> sure. Of course. Um, well, I mean the, the pro and the con of the fact that most of my work is a solo um, B at wine reach breweries, distilleries, that kind of thing. Um, the, the benefit and the, and the curse is that I mostly get to choose what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So within a within a confine you know uh people aren't at the brewery on a sunday afternoon because they want to hear my songs you know they don't know my songs um they may like my songs i may play them anywhere from three to ten of my songs over the course of a day but they're not here for me they're not even here for me playing covers like i am here to be a funky wallpaper you know yeah. i'm here to i'm not i'm not the art on the wall i'm the wallpaper behind it um and so it's a lot of trying to balance out uh, the songs that I like and that I can relate to and that I can can really uh, respond to with songs that they'll know or songs that they should, in my opinion, know, which is sort of where my being <laughs> a snob comes mm -hmm. into place. But, you know, I sort of also operate on the idea that, like, do you want someone that can come and sing, you know, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd and American Pie? Sure. Hundreds of guys can do that. Anyone who can play three chords can do those songs. Um, and I can do those songs, too. They're in my book. But, you know, how many guys are going to come in with multiple Guy Clark songs? How many guys are going to come in with multiple Towns Van Zandt songs? How many guys are going to come in playing... Uh, you know, Hank Williams followed by Neil Young followed by Lord, you know, mm -hmm. or, or Taylor Swift. Like I, I love to play songs that I love, whether it's because they emotionally move me, whether it's because they intellectually move me, whether it's because they musically are, are interesting. There's a lyric that I think is, is relevant. Um, you know, my selection is, a little weird. I don't always go for the biggest hit. I go for the one that speaks to me. Mm -hmm. So you say, hey, do you know? Uh, no, I can't think of an example, of course, off the top of my head, but um, you know, do you know Towns Van Zandt? Yes. And of course, I know Poncho and Lefty, and I play it a fair amount, but it's not my favorite town song. So I'll play a lesser known one because I think it's an incredible piece of writing that if you as an audience don't know it, you should. Like, you've missed mm -hmm. this song, and you should, 
it should be a part of your life because it is so good. So there's a there's a degree to which I'm trying to share things that are not as widely known, but then also bounce back and say, okay, we're feeling a little bit flabby. Maybe I should play some gin blossoms. Maybe I should play some something big. Um, and I try to find ways too to make that into the show a little more. Uh, with with stage banter, with uh, introductions, out, you know, intros, outros, different songs. Um, you know, I do uh, not every show, but I'll do a, a cover. If I could turn back time by Cher, which is a great Diane Warren, you know, hollering song. Uh, I can't sing it quietly. It's it's one that just has to be yeah. belted. And so I'll typically uh, apologize in advance for what's about to happen uh, and tell them it'll be over soon. And then I'll bust into a song that everybody knows and most people love, uh, sing it full throatedly, full heartedly, and then explain to them at the end of it that what happens, you see, is that as, during my show, sometimes I have this diva wave that washes over me and all I can do is sing share till it goes away. Um, this, if people have already responded to the song, they're now listening to me talk about it. They're now laughing. They're having a good time. Um, this gets me better tips. This gets me better gigs. This gets me... Sure, absolutely. No, because not a, because are you because the venue is seeing you like kill it with them is seeing you make the patrons happy, which is the goal. But meanwhile, you're making yourself happy by continuing to bring in songs that are interesting and exciting for you. Um, is there an element that you're trying to build an audience to, or is it, or are you sort of exclusively? thinking of yourself as the wallpaper in these gigs. Like, I, I guess my question is, I'm, I'm thinking about my friend, Nick, who runs the Michigan City Chamber Music Festival. And the magical thing about that festival is it's a lot of like very well and carefully curated classical music, but he brings new and interesting and difficult music to it every summer as well. Mm -hmm. And he's been developing this audience to in like a small and relatively blue collar town to be open to full works of classical music, complex works of classical music, difficult works of classical mm -hmm. music. Um, and he's been building them up for years so that he can drop hard stuff into the middle right. of that series. And, and they love it. Um, I, I want, I, I bet that it's not the case that you're like having audiences follow you from venue to venue at this point a year into your residency in in Austin but like how much audience building are you thinking about it if any uh thinking about quite a bit succeeding at less so um hmm. but uh you know i'm starting the first year was kind of about just like survive don't you know don't die don't drown stay above yep. get it done um, and I'm still to some level there, but I'm starting to be able to focus a little more and think, okay, what can I do? How can I get people to follow my Instagram? How can I get people to engage with me a little bit more so that when I post my show tomorrow, they'll say, oh, hey, my friends in that neighborhood, I'll tell them if they got nothing else going on to go check the show out. Um, you know, I... And again, how much of that is because I'm playing my own stuff and drawing their attention versus playing just stuff that they like or stuff they're interested by. Um, so I'm beginning now to sort of see, okay, how many times should I mention the Instagram per set? How many mm -hmm. times should I talk about that? And I'm not very good at it yet. Uh, but in an ideal show, right now without even doing all that much you know plugging for myself besides just the music um i might get two follows a show which for mm -hmm. not a lot of work is, is pretty good um and there are not an awful lot of people who are coming to my shows on purpose but there are a few um mm -hmm. i have certainly had even this week i had people who i have met at previous shows who saw that i was playing somewhere near them and just thought well we're going to go out and watch the ball game anyway. Let's go watch it here where this guy's going to sing some songs we like, you know? Mm -hmm. So it starts to be the function. And I think there's, there's a lot of, of deciding what path to follow currently. Um, yeah. And so I've been doing a lot more kind of 
uh, working on deciding how best to use my time, which I'm terrible at. Um, <laughs> time, time management skills are very important and very weak at my end. So that's an that's, uphill battle, but. You know, it, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm listening to you talk about like the craft of, I, I always find the craft to be the most fascinating thing, right? I'm listening to you talk about the craft of how do you bring people to your list? How do you attract, how do you interest people during your sets? How do you then begin to bring them back to what you're doing? And there are so many parallels, maybe not directly to like the classical musician who has just moved to a new town and is trying to get some freelance work, right? You're not mm -hmm. necessarily building your own sets and thinking about your repertoire, because really what you want is for an orchestra to hire you to play their repertoire, ideally. Right. But um, there's so much also, and a, a small chamber group doesn't necessarily have the flexibility that you have with like a pantheon of songs in their head that they can pull out. They're coming with the book that they have. But you're also describing how you're using the stage banter and your stage presence to bring the audience along with you. If you're going to uh, raise the roof with something that is outside of the, the norm that you have established yourself at the beginning of the set, you're going to talk to them and you're going to explain why mm -hmm. and get them on your side. And this is all very valuable stuff for, for classical musicians as well. And for people in business, you're, all of us in music are in the business of us, whether you're doing, you know, a read making business or like the coaching work that I'm doing, or whether you're just trying to like get yourself hired more and get mm -hmm. yourself paid more. And believe me, listeners, I'm always on the side of musicians getting paid more and getting more work, doing the thing that they love to do. Mm -hmm. And part of it is this, we all have the responsibility of building the audience that we want to have in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very much. And I was thinking as you were talking about that, I mean, the f I have not seen you play as many times as I would like to have. Um, but the times, but the times that I have, you've always been very, you, you are very engaging between, you know, you'll play the piece, then you'll make a joke about it. Then you'll talk about the next piece. And like, you're, you're, I, I don't go to as much classical music as I, as I should just as a general rule of thumb, but um, what I have gone to most times feels less, engaging in that way because like that taking a moment to say here's why i thought this was worth doing here's why mm -hmm. i thought here's the relevance to this song here's how this song relates to the last one i just played here's how mm -hmm. um you know there's there's so much in that that just grows the process to me and maybe you won't get the reference i'm making maybe you won't get how these songs are paired but if you do, it's just that much more fun. It's that much more like, oh, what an interesting thought. I'm so glad this got brought to my attention, you know? Um, yes. Yeah, exactly. When I'm, crafting a, when I'm crafting a recital, I'm thinking about the arc of it from a, from a performance standpoint, right? I, I need to be, make sure that I can get through the arc of it and that it makes sense to me. But I also want to make sure that, that I'm helping the audience through. Classical music is not quite so much like playing 70s pop songs that people should know right it's um there's there's a lot of new material happening and sure, the stuff that is the most interesting to me is often the hardest to listen to so mm -hmm. i feel like it's a, a huge responsibility to give the audience a way in and to allow them to leave the event going uh wow perhaps i will attend another classical music event right rather right. than whew, thank god that's over yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I certainly, I you know, I'm, I'm sure I've had my share of those shows too, um, but it's it's a matter of of finding the right, you know, some days you barely talk at all. Some days are just not here for it, and you just kind of play and you play and you play and you play and you make little, you know, and some days you talk more than you play. I've had certainly had shows where I've just been chatty and and people in front of me have been chatting with me. So you just mm -hmm. kind of keep going and you tell stories and tell jokes and you, you do your thing. Um, you know, as I've been struggling as a writer of late, mm -hmm. you know, I have not been 
I mean, really the last two or three years, which I can't imagine why I would be stressed out and having difficulty in the last, I don't know, three years of American life. Um, I don't know. There's like nothing, nothing really going on. Yeah. It's just the quiet, oh, yeah. calm times, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm kind of beginning to recognize in myself that as much as the writing is important, as much as, as, as I desperately want and need to be creating more original material, um, I don't necessarily need to be performing it. Like I need to be performing. Uh, performing is what I is what I truly love and truly relate to. But in as much as I'm choosing what I get to perform, it doesn't have to be mine. Um, There's a creativity in bringing the sets that you bring and leading the audience in a direction. And it's not the same creativity as songwriting, but it's, a different yeah. interesting creativity for a restless creative mind. Yeah, and it's and it's the kind of thing I mean you think about I mean you think about so many of the performers of the of the last 50 60 years how many of them did or didn't write their own material. I mean for every Lennon McCartney you know you get a a Dusty in Memphis where like none of that's mm -hmm. original. Right. Dusty Springfield is just a great singer. You know, yep. Frank Sinatra didn't write, to my knowledge. He just sang. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And I, well, I'm not comparing myself to Dusty Springfield or Frank Sinatra on this level. Like, I'm not at that level of quality, but but I'm good at what I do. Sure. And if I can bring something unique, something new to my take on Crazy by Patsy Cline, uh, it's by Willie Nelson, isn't it? It is by Willie Nelson, in fact. Um, but I fear most people know the Platzi Klein version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. Which, uh, to my knowledge, actually is still, after all these years, the most played jukebox song in America. Um, hmm. But uh, th there's something to that, too. Like, there's no... Because, like, I'm a good writer. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not writing crazy by Willie Nelson, you know? I'm not writing always on my sure. mind. I'm not writing these landslide you know but if i get to play these songs and i get to make people happy by playing these songs and i get to make me happy playing these songs there's something to that and that yes i want to do my own shows and yes i want to do my own sets but more and more i'm recognizing that like even in a more focused show i'll still play five or six covers out of 15 because they're fun and because they they move me in a way that my songs don't always, you know. Yeah, um, they, they're 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 important to you in a way that you haven't quite written yet. Yeah, yeah, and um, fully in agreement, right? I I think all the time about the creativity of being an interpretive artist, which is you know what most of us mm -hmm. musicians are. I'm playing, you know, what's on my stand. I've got Ruth Gibbs, and I've got some Beethoven, and I got some Debussy, and I got some stuff. I didn't write any of that. I'm my creativity is taking those notes on the page and making them mine. But then also, of course, I've got my book and it was so fun to write my book. And that's something that I had never done before. That's actual creativity. Felt yeah, great about absolutely. that. And I keep meaning to read it. I haven't done it yet because I'm a terrible brother. Yeah, get but on, that. Get get on that, James. I'm the worst. Fraud and a hack. <laughs> all, all, all good. Um, James, I want to make sure that you get a chance to, I will, of course, put all of your links in the show notes, but I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about your Patreon or any uh, links or things that you want people to check out before we close here. Uh, yeah, so I guess the biggest thing right now, uh, and again, in the sink or swim, survive the recession, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, I am running a, a Patreon page, which is a place where people can uh can offer to donate, you know, a dollar a month or, or three or five or whatever they feel comfortable doing um, and get access to, I've been posting, you know, live videos that are not available to the public. I've been posting when I do write new songs, I'll demo them and put them up there. I'm intending to do uh, more uh, writing and, and, you know, cover videos, original videos. I'm trying to, I'm putting more and more up to make it more and more worth people's time to do it um but then it, it just basically challenges once a month you you automatically it pays five dollars and i get that five dollars and if 100 people give me five dollars each then that's my rent you know or that's not my rent rent is way higher than that in austin but um 
mm-hmm. you know, it's it's just a matter of a little bit of support coming in, a little bit of extra help um, that maybe in the longer term will help me have one fewer gig I don't want per month so that I can write or that I can do better research on the gigs I do want or that I can do, um, you know, I've got a couple of bands as well. So it's, and those gigs longer term may be more lucrative, but short term they're usually less because you can only get paid so much per head. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like just a little bit of support. And in exchange for that, you get to have much more access to me, the creator. And I'm, and I'm working to find ways to make that more compelling as well, which we'll see how that goes, but (laughs) Yeah, I feel like it's a there there's something lovely there. I in the the Patreon model where there where in exchange for like a really moderate amount of money there gets to be some creativity given to you. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's you the thing these are the things that you would be doing Anyway, you would be writing, you would be performing, you would be making things, but you keep some of it exclusive for the people who are like, who are giving you small amounts of support. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it. so it's just, it's a matter, you know, I mean, there's always the, the, the Kickstarter and all those things to do to make records with. And I've done a couple of those in the past and they've been, they've been great, but um, this is hopefully a more sustainable, you know, I can't give anybody $25 every month, but I can do five. And mm-hmm. so I've got a couple of, you know, podcasts that I listen to. I've got a couple of, of musicians that I follow who I give five bucks a month to because I can afford that much roughly. Um, and if it helps them get a little further along, great. You know, um, it's a, it's a pretty good system. It's very easy to use. Uh, and I have been, not doing as much as I should be to build it. And that's sort of what I'm working on now is trying to find ways to uh, extend that reach um, and extend the Instagram reach, which is typically the easiest way to promote shows for me. So people will will hunt you down in those places once I once you hand your links to me and I pop them into the show notes. Right, right. Perfect. That's, that's the hope anyway. That's the, that's the entire plan. James, what a treat to get to talk with you. I don't know why we don't talk more often, being as how we are related and all. Uh, this was such a joy. Um, it's been great. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for having me. Yay, fun. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe on your app of choice and leave a review too, because it really helps us. Don't forget to check out the Ultimate Music Business Summit. It's happening January 5th through the 7th, and it's going to have a ton of value for creative entrepreneurs. You can check out the link in the show notes and grab the early bird discount before October 31st. Our theme music was composed by Dream Vance. You can hear his newest album, Rama, on Spotify and Apple Music and follow him there for more innovative synthwave music. You can find me at JanetIngle.com which is also where you can pick up a copy of the Happiest Musician book, reach out to me with thoughts or questions about the podcast, or apply for a possibility session to explore your own portfolio career and thriving musical life. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.